We have a Polar White DS Lite to clean today. Let's see if it works first. Mm, this power button is really slow and sticky. Something was spilled that got stuck right there. All right, no response from the touchpad, but I feel like that's kind of always how they are. It says touch screen, but then you end up having to push a button to get it going anyway. No response from the DS slot. And it looks like it's not picking up anything from the Game Boy Advance cartridge slot either. So let's get it turned off, taken apart, and see how bad it is inside. Battery looks good. I'm gonna use my pry tool to put right here in this gap and then run it along and we should be able to separate the bottom part of the case that way. There we go. Ooh, that's gross in there. And whatever got spilled, got spilled underneath that and kind of welded it to the plastic there almost. This is where it's the worst though. This really sticky power button. In fact, I'm having to use these pliers, even though that piece should be loose, just because the stickiness had kind of cemented it to the case there. I want to be aware that there's a nut in there, and I might take that out, but it's really, really small. I have to decide. I don't want to get it wet, though. Uh, I wanted to have that together so I could show you how it goes back together. The right side is held on by some adhesive, so I'm just going to slowly release that. I'm going to release that gate to get this cable out of the way. Only one screw to get the motherboard off. We can remove these plugs with our spudger. I'm going to have to fish this black wire underneath the cartridge holder here. And getting it back through when we're done is definitely one of the more fun parts of this teardown and reassembly. Okay, our motherboard should be released, except we wanna be careful of the one cable on the bottom here that's still connected. Oh, that gate is really stuck on there. There we go, we got it. Actually, it was kind of difficult to pull out too. I'm gonna to have to make sure to clean that well. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the touch screen from the motherboard here. Another stuck gate with a stuck cable, but we got it. And that's basically what I was expecting it to look like underneath the buttons. When something gets spilled on, that's one of the easiest places for it to kind of get into and then get gummy and sticky. All right, now we're kind of getting to the most fun part of this teardown and the reassembly, working with the hinge system on these DSs and 3DSs. Super fun. I'm gonna pull these two wires through here first and just kind of get them out of the way. And then we'll deal with the ribbon cable. I'm gonna just kind of get that up through there, being careful not to tear the cable, get it loose and released. I am using this dental pick to get these little hider things out of the way. Be very careful if you choose to use metal, I don't recommend it. Sorry, I missed the footage somehow of getting the back of the screen off. just carefully loosening this screen so that I can move it over just enough to be able to get that ribbon cable through. I had to take my gloves off here 
to be able to coil up and hold this ribbon cable around these wires to be able to work it through this small opening. My fingers feel naked and ashamed. All right, I think we're getting it. There we go. I'll just get these wires through and we're done with this part. Get the hinge and then we're done. There are these little flappy things here that work as kind of a bumper so that when you close the system, it doesn't just hit plastic on plastic. But they're really annoying when you're taking it apart and cleaning it because you could break them off pretty easily. And I want to be careful not to do that. using my 99% solution of isopropyl alcohol, and we will get this clean going. Basically, I am looking for all of the places where there's anything sticky, which doesn't actually show up super well on the camera, but I can find them. I wanna make sure to clean out these cartridge slots really well. I'm gonna be careful with my Q-tip when working on any of these screens, not to press too hard and cause any more scratches. Let's polish it up with the glass cleaner and microfiber cloth. It's not perfect, but I'm going to continue to use this touch screen. Now we have our top screen. We can get all the edges and everything de-gunked and de-stickified. Stickified? Yeah, I think stickified is the word. Same thing with this screen, being really careful, then we'll just give it a good polish with our glass cleaner and our microfiber cloth. This screen doesn't get near the abuse that the touch screen does, obviously because of the touching and the stylus that people use on it. So it looks pretty good when it's cleaned. I forgot about these black rings that go into the speakers because they were just stuck on there. A lot of times when you take these out of the systems, those rings just kind of remain when you pull the speaker up. Just want to make sure to get all these parts nice and clean. I did not want to put this in with the pieces that soaked in the soapy water because of the little screw that's on this that can't come off. So we're just going to do this one by hand. And it looks pretty good, I think. Okay, we're just gonna give this a good scrub clean with this soapy water and see how it comes out. Shout outs again to the few people who commented and recommended that I use a paintbrush for some of my cleaning with the soapy water. It actually works really well. I will still use the toothbrush to get into some of the harder to reach places or to scrub a little bit, but I like this paintbrush. I am curious whether or not this is going to remove uh, most of the kind of slight faded color I'm hoping just cleaning does a good enough job on this one. Even if not, I am hesitant to do retro brighting. And a number of people have pointed that out and asked why or if we're aware of it. If uh, Steve at Tronix Fix or myself, if we uh, are familiar with the process. And so it's story time. I'm going to explain to you why I don't use retro brighting or haven't to this point and probably won't. If you aren't familiar, retrobriting is a process by which combining ultraviolet light and hydrogen peroxide, the yellow discoloring of certain plastics can be restored kind of to their original light gray or white color. These discolorations aren't stains. The plastic itself has actually undergone a chemical change, uh, and retrobriting can at least temporarily reverse that process. When I was brainstorming this channel last winter, I did my own research on retrobriting because it's become pretty much like industry standard treatment on YouTube for video game console restoration niche. I was prepared to create my own UV light box. 
I was going to start stocking up on hydrogen peroxide, but the more I looked into it, the less sure I was that I wanted to get into it. I enjoy watching the process, and the end result always looks so amazing that I knew I was taking a risk for my channel if I didn't do it. But after reading about it and giving the entire thing a good long think, I concluded that Retrobrite was not in line with the specific values of my channel of what I wanted to create. So I made that decision, but the decision did weigh on me and caused me to doubt myself, so much so that it directly influenced the name of this channel, Restoreish. I was anxious that I wouldn't be accepted by the gatekeepers of the community on the basis of what makes for true restoration. I thought maybe I would face this potential criticism right from the start with a measure of self-deprecating humor. This isn't restore, this is restore-ish. You know, we're kind of doing it. And so we move forward, closing in on 20 projects or so. Uh, most of them imperfect restorations betraying my status as a noob in one way or another. None of them using Retrobrite. So why? Why have I decided that this is the line in the sand that I'm going to draw on what I'm willing to do for restoring? The reason I've chosen not to use Retrobrite is because to me it stands as an example of the perfect ideal restoration that people look at on a screen and love the results visually, but very, very few people would actually do. Most people, unless they really love restoring, aren't going to put the time and money into building a complex UV light box and buying gallons of hydrogen peroxide just to temporarily restore the shiny light gray plastic color on their childhood Super Nintendo. As a result, when people see this process again and again, they subconsciously determine that restoring junk is something they will watch other people do for the satisfaction factor, but not engage in themselves. I realize the vast majority of people who watch my content also are probably here just because of the satisfaction of seeing something renewed. And that's okay. But I want to be intentional in my messaging that breathing life into something, giving new life to something, whether it's your Game Boy, your relationships, yourself, that it's okay to try your best to work with the tools and skills you have and not get it perfect. Just try. You don't need the elaborate UV light box to love it again. And if you aren't trying because you know you won't meet the standard, then I hope to encourage you that it's worth trying even if the result isn't 100% faultlessly shiny new. In fact, I think I've gotten into a bad habit of acting surprised every time I get something to work again just by cleaning it. I know this doesn't always work. And I don't want to make people think that repair work is never necessary. If something needs a repair or replacement part, no amount of cleaning is going to fix it. But when I look back over my last 17 projects, a good number of them have ended up working just from cleaning them. I have right now on my shelf behind me nearly a dozen consoles, controllers, and handhelds that went from being junk to being usable and clean, each of them being an item that somebody at some point decided was no longer worth it. I'm not trying to kick mud at the people who use retrobriting. I actually like watching those videos and it is very satisfying to see what can be done to make things look as new as possible again. But I have chosen not to use it because I want to encourage people to engage in restoring and improving and I don't want something that is purely cosmetic to place a barrier in front of their willingness to try. All right. It's nice to see that power button not be gunked up anymore. And our volume slider. I think cleaning soda pop residue is one of the most satisfying things to do on these handhelds. I'm just going to show you how this mechanism works and sets on one side here and then we'll just do the other side off camera. We just gotta bend that spring around and tuck it there. And there we go. We wanna make sure that our slider here is in the same position as our switch. And make sure the wires aren't being pinched on the back here when you put this together. All right, 
Let's see if it works. We can at least see if I broke it further. I'm actually able to get into a game here on the Game Boy Advance. I did learn while doing this that I probably did it wrong when I tested it because you actually have to have the game in the off position before you put the cartridge in for it to read a Game Boy Advance game. Now Steve just gave me a suggestion because this game slot still wasn't working. So I'm going to put a generous amount of isopropyl alcohol on a game cartridge here and insert it again and again a bunch of times and then try the game that I actually want to play. And hey, that actually works. So, good. Thanks for watching.